Um, and for the next hour, we are going to uh, open it up to panel discussion uh, so that there is interaction between uh, each of the presenters and between the audience and the presenters. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, get out of the way and let the, let the conversation go, let the conversation happen. Um, just to kick it off, uh, so uh, you need to be uh, uh, prepping your questions, formulating your <coughs> questions. I'll kick it off with a question uh, to the panel and let you go from there. Uh, and then uh, if, if uh, I can see hands, uh, I'll call it out, I'll, I'll point you out, and just stand up and project your voice so that the panelists can hear and so that the uh, rest of the community here can hear. Um, and I want to uh, start things off with this question. Uh, I, I see this discussion as going in a number of different directions. There's way too much to talk about. Uh, this, this room is overflowing with uh, yeah, issues and questions. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, but uh, one of the directions that I think would be profitable to pursue, and it's one that was brought up in the question and answer time that uh, you alluded to uh, one way or another, is the issue of the body. Um, and I want to pose that question to each of you because it seemed to come up in a lot of the uh, discussions, the presentations in one way or another. And that is that in... Uh, to not have to deal with religion as a whole, or religion as a generality in relation to contemporary art, but uh, being here at Biola to talk about Christian uh, religion, Christian practice and theology specifically, that the body holds a very central place, uh, as it seems to in contemporary art, contemporary issues across the board, philosophy, uh, sociology, anthropology, etc. And the question is, is, is this, uh, within Christianity, we are not entirely preoccupied with the transcendent. The transcendent uh, of this world is certainly important, and uh, we believe that existence is not um, explainable strictly in mechanical, physical terms. However, also in Christian theology, you have a God who is the author of physical existence um, and who disrupts it wildly with the uh, central paradox of Christian faith being the incarnation uh, where the, uh, the transcendent and the physical are, are linked in a historical uh, point in time and space. Um, point. That's crude. Sorry. It's not very, uh, it's, it's not very uh, specific, uh, precise. Um, uh, so given that background of theol or Christian Christianity on the one hand, and then contemporary thought on the other, where we have issues of uh, uh, post-humanity, the body being altered, uh, issues of identity being sorted out in physical bodily terms, uh, a number of psychologists and sociologists talking about identity in performative terms. That you, we, we bodily perform identity and um, uh, uh, issue, uh, ideas of liturgy, perhaps, being a model for explaining social systems, etc., etc. Um, how do you think that that may provide a point of intersection uh, or a further complication to the strange place of religion and contemporary art. Um, and I will uh, let you run from there. Very good. Clarification? <laughs> and, uh, and since I don't have a microphone, you're in charge. Whoever wants to speak. There's a long um, critical history in 20th century modernism, starting more or less from surrealism, about um, hypostasis, um, materiality, and the absence of um, anything afterward, no resurrection, in other words. And so that goes through surrealist theories and goes up um, into recent accounts in art history, and it includes things, um, things that you were talking about, Karen, and, uh, and uh, people like Hubert Dummisch, there's a, a, a French art historian who was very interested in materiality to the extent that he had the notion that in paintings it's the paint that thinks, not the person who paints. 
Um, it's pure, it's pure embodiment, pure materiality, um, base materiality, as some people like to call it, um, with no possibility of um, redemption. So just to put that in the mix, there is that would be, that's maybe one of the limits that we could look at when we're when we're looking at these parallels. Well, uh, for myself, I, I don't know. I you know I come out of theory lane and art center, so. <clears throat> the interesting thing about this question to me is that, you know, within post-structuralism, what ends up happening is we go from an essentialized theory to a de-essentialized body identity theory. I think, which is r really why um, <clears throat> a lot of groups within art and culture has taken on the, the post-human cybernetic identity model as some kind of global agency is because they need to counterbalance that with de-essentialized identity structures. So when you talk about this question of the body <clears throat> in relation to what is it, artistic practice as a Christian? Is that what you're asking? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 artistic I, practice on the one hand and theological practice on the other. Could well, I, I think one the same, if there's any kind of strategy to be had here, I think you have to say, well, you know, whenever somebody creates some kind of a boundary or a border and says, oh, we don't have a body anymore, well, great, now we can go on to talking about the body again, because that's kind of what happens, is to dismantle the boundary, is to re reinvestigate and reinvigorate the older models of discussion. I think that's partly why we have the cybernetic model now. So, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's being too esoteric in the way I'm talking about it, but I think essentially it's like saying, you know what, a, a lot of different sites of ideas are up for grabs. Take one, and insert yourself into it, which is what cybernetic identity theories is, is about, and, and run with it and see where you go. Because we've had, we've had the post of post, right? Well, the word post is so old now that it's, it's old. <coughs> so then where do you go? There's, a, there's so many ways to go, and why limit yourself to saying, well, what are the rules? You know, why, why do we have to sit here and talk about the body then? Why, why, why don't we go with cybernetic? And why don't we go someplace beyond that? Or, because the cybernetic, Donna Haraway wrote that in what, the 80s? Yeah. Right? And so, and I, I always know it's always Stella and, and Orlan, and who do we have now? And, and they, whoever is out there right now is not going to be doing exactly what Orlan has done, but something that surpasses it. And so I, I, I feel like in some ways our discussion is a slightly dated one, mm -hmm. and which gives you as artists freedom to m move past it. Although, and just, just so I add an appendix, the, the, this, there is this one living strand of it, as far as I can see, and that is this worry about whether or not material can think for itself. And there's a center that was recently started in Maastricht in the Netherlands called the Pensive Image, a postgraduate program, if any of you are looking for one, <laughs> in which the object is to try to figure out if it makes sense to say things like, paint thinks, my drawing thinks. Well, are they saying that in kind of a, a metaphorical term or an actuality? Well, this is a question. Yeah. <laughs> How much sense can it make? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm less concerned about the body in general and more concerned about my body, I suppose. All right, I'm, I'm, unconcerned, about, I'm unconcerned about the body in general because I find that to be disembodied thought. I'm interested in my body and in how I respond to work. Uh, I spent two formative years studying with the critic Donald Cuspett at Stony Brook, and he told me how much he consumed art, like M&Ms. And I found that to be a metaphor that I've never forgotten. And in terms of my writing, I want uh, my body to be present in uh, what I have to say about, um, about a certain artist. So I'm, I'm interested in how my body responds to a certain artist's work, whether it's an artist like Enrique Martinez Celaya or an artist I'm involved in working on a project with right now, Robin O'Neill. Uh, I'm interested in my body and how my body responds to that work, and I want to communicate that in my writing. And so I want to have, I want to stress, I want to put pressure on my writing to be able to make it, uh, uh, to give it a certain kind of corporal presence. And so, in some ways, as I've begun to develop my, um, uh, my way of, of working in, um, uh, in this area, I, I become less and less interested in generalities and inter less interested in, 
in, um, in thinking about these issues as issues that I can separate myself from. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm solely concerned, or I'm not solely concerned, I'm more concerned about communicating some sort of, of presence um, in my writing and uh, in my response to the work. And that, that has to do with the fact that for 10 years I was shaped and molded by curatorial practice in which I worked with collectors, I worked with uh, docents, I worked with students, I worked with artists uh, in, in, installing, um, in installing work, curating work, um, talking in front of it. And there's one way of, of thinking about your body in relationship to your experience of an artwork when you're standing in front of it talking to 25 or 50 docents who will then need to give tours to other people about the work or to, uh, or to reflect on the capacity or the incapacity of language to, um, uh, to encapsulate your experience of the work when you're standing in front of it, talking about it, and what your relationship to, what your words, uh, relationship to, that, to those objects actually are. And I think something interesting and I think something uh, uh, provocative occurs at that, at that moment. And so I'm interested in the sense of the body in the sense in a very selfish, self-obsessed way. I'm interested in clarifying things for myself. And it's my body that I'm really interested in. And I'm hoping that when people read, when readers read the things I have to say, um, that there's a sense of my physical presence there. And, I have, and there is some sort of um, uh, embodiment. This would be a really interesting conversation to carry on if we all went outside and came, went into the gallery. Because the, some of the works in the gallery that are up now have very much to do with abstract bodies, infinite bodies, transcendent bodies. The kind of thing, and you would remember this, Dan, from the book State of Art Criticism, that Boris Groys goes on against um, Deleuze and French theorists with their theories of infinite bodies. And he right. says, he says, Boris Groys says, I am, I don't know about these people, but I have only one body and it's getting old and all the organs are failing. And, and so, so some of the other works in the, in the gallery there definitely have to do with that other kind of, um, that other kind of experience body. That's it. And so then I guess the question for us would be whether or not those two discourses fit, how they fit. Uh, actually, I've, I, I've been always, I've been wanting to tell you guys this, and, and Karen and I were talking about this, is that, you know, I, and I was wondering about your opinion on this too, is that uh, there, there's so much feeling of threat about something like post-modernity, post-structuralism, and decentralized body theories, but in the end, you know that they will, they, those are failing theories. And I think, you know, when um, Derrida is dying, he's, has anxiety about his own death. And I, I was telling Karen, I said, you know, I've always had this notion that post-structuralist theory is rather romantic because they know that they will ultimately fail. And it is built, their system is built on the failure by the very fact that when you're talking about post-structuralism and <clears throat> the suspicion of order, you are taught that in a university Socratic method structure. And, and so it was really stimulating. And so I, I posit that this idea of de-essentialized identities merely to say you can, you can take it wherever you want that, that doesn't ever negate your presence because it is already in a system of failure. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and so just to, keep, just to, to carry on one of the threads of this um, a little further then. So uh, Georges Bataille, the surrealist uh, theorist, made a really concerted effort to have a theory of a body which, from which there is no resurrection. Um, but one of the forces of that theory is the way that it was always failing. Um, and he, and this is a somewhat grisly subject, but we were talking about this earlier, he used to have pictures of a Chinese execution that he kept in his jacket pocket, and he would take them out of once in a while, look at them, presumably furtively, and put them back in, because they represented to him the figure under who was being tortured and executed in these photographs he owned reminded him of the crucifixion. But it was a crucifixion with no afterward, no afterlife, no issue. But the fact that this was an image which couldn't be used like any other image, and the fact would, that this image actually ruined the art practices he was supporting, and the fact that the image still re these images still remain outside of art and remain so problematic is a sign that these theories are always failing, or to put it in a somewhat um, less critical way, the interest of the theory is that it's so hard to maintain it. But that's what makes it fun. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I think that's, that's why they enjoyed doing what they were doing, is because... because well, fun of is it. kind of strange well, to apply to that I example, mean? but yes, I do know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
um, I think one of the things to keep in view um, that I referred to very generally is that consideration of these issues are, are in a constant change of flux and, and debate. Um, but I, I think it's, it's something that's really important um, to keep in view um, as we engage in this debate is that these ideas are constantly being reconsidered. And for example, right now, it, as Christina said, some of these issues are already 20 years past. And that doesn't mean that, that ideas that had currency in the past don't have an ongoing life or don't have things to reveal to us on an ongoing basis. But many of these ideas, if you look at uh, Princeton University Press's um, series New French Thought, you know, are, are really um, questioning um, the viability of many of these ideas, and um, in sense, uh, reasserting um, what does this really mean? What do some of these ideas mean for how we actually live? How much do they really reveal when Derrida, you know, lives in uh, finds that he is actually fearful of his own of his own death? You know, that's telling us something that we have to reconsider those ideas and and how much they really bring to us. Um, and I think the question of, of the body in part is um, that it is important to you know, think in theoretical terms, but uh, as Dan was saying, when it comes right down to us, we experience and we know things through our bodies. <laughs> and that's just the reality of the way we do experience them. And somehow we have to grapple with that. Um, I've been kind of silent about it because I think I am so confused about the body. I'm really envious about you talking about bringing the body to it um, because, and I love that, I was listening and I just wanted to ask you how are you doing it because I feel, you know, I wouldn't be going to Weight Watchers if I had that good of a connection in some sense <laughs> to, to the body. So, uh, and I'm, I'm fascinated by, uh, I, I think I'm confused even more because I'm planning to do a seminar on hysteria next fall, which is sort of the body speaking in mm -hmm. unruly ways, and going back to some gendered criticism and, and thinking about how it might, of course, the DSM in psychology says it's no longer a disease. You can't have hysteria now. Um, now you're bipolar. <laughs> so, I'm sure someone told that to Britney Spears. <laughs> so it's, I'm curious about how these concepts mutate and, and function. And I'm, I'm very interested in ideas of the connection and disconnection with bodies and subjecthood and how those things relate. The Cyborg Handbook talks uh, a lot about um, living cadavers and the very difficult procedure in hospitals when someone is plugged in but no longer really there? And how do you treat those bodies? Because they're literally living and dead at the same time. They're waiting to be harvested for organs. And one of the first things the nurses working with them have to do is take away the name. So, take, so the name's connection to a body. And, and the patient has to be clinically dehumanized, depersonalized. Mm -hmm. and, and these living cadavers do, I think some of my interest, it was just the, the fascination. I mean, they can be lying there. It's probably a pretty boring job working with a living cadaver, just watching over them. But occasionally, they can suddenly, the arm will shoot up or the eyes will open wide. <laughs> and these were very disturbing things for nurses who had been through it all to deal with. And, and what that state is, what, what, where does personhood end and, and, um, and our bodies begin. So there, I have a lot of confusion about bodies right now, especially my own. <laughs> 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 If you have an answer, John. <laughs> I do, I do, but uh, I'm going to withhold uh, for the sake of the, the audience. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I want to pursue that further, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, defer to the audience. Um, and maybe they'll pursue it further. Uh, so if any of you have a question, uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you space to put it to the uh, panel oh. at this point. I actually have a question. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there's something that was, has not been discussed here is the problems within contemporary art. And I was wondering about that in terms of your book because I don't know if it was an organic kind of build in terms of the, the workings of your book, but uh, you, you cite the problem in religion versus contemporary art. And yet you also talk about this, the series of phobias, which makes me consider, you know, within the paradigm of post-structuralism, they talk so much about anxiety. Perhaps you're, what you're actually addressing is the anxiety of truth within, within post-structuralism that is the underlying you know, foundation of contemporary art today. And, and I wonder why you didn't go in that direction as opposed to locating yourself within the topic of religion. Well, I mean, I've just started thinking about phobia. <laughs> That's a new oh, thing. Okay. I like the, uh, the idea of thinking about um, fears because it seems like the best way for me to understand what some of my colleagues do um, um, in university and art history departments. So, I mean, it's a new thing, that's why it's not in there, but uh, in, in some deep sense, definitely, the, the, if they are anything like fears, then, then you don't have to be a Freudian to, you know, you don't have to be Freudian to sleuth out what it is that they're afraid of. Um, and um, I would want to be careful about um, talking about Derrida um, too much in these terms, because he was very reflective about these things. Um, I don't know about, um, how much some of these things would have taken him by surprise. I think that the, 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 he knew what refusals there were and, and why he was refusing things. And so that means, that's encouraging to me because that means that there, there are available, there are ways to start opening these discussions that will not provoke um, you know, hives from people in art history departments. Mm -hmm. Well, what I find interesting is that you, you don't really address the, the problem because, you know, I mean, this is a criticism that has been put upon contemporary art by minority, art, artists of minority groups, is that, you know, contemporary art says that they accept all and do all, and yet, why is it that my work is always substandard? And I think when you talk about this in relationship to religious art, it smacks of kind of the same thing, and I kind of wonder why, you know, by you not addressing the problems within contemporary art and its inability to hold this kind of discussion, I think you tend to prop up that image of the universal, you know, definer of what contemporary art is, which has been criticized severely starting from the 80s on. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering if that was something you thought about and why that was not part and parcel of this book. Yeah, that's a, wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I would, to do that justice, I would really have to think about it. I don't, I... Uh, the, ki the kind of answer I would have in mind, the kind of answer, is that Lauren back there? <laughs> Such a taskmaster. The kind, of, <laughs> the, the kind of answer that I would have in mind would be something like, um, this is an issue which needs to have some preparatory ground in order to make sense when it's raised. Mm -hmm. So there would be, have to be other projects leading on out of this in order to explore that. That would be the kind of answer, and I know that's, that's not even like a preparatory answer, but that's the kind of answer that I would give. Well, do you see that as a direction for yourself? I mean, no, because absolutely. you kind of start to hint at this. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, well, I don't know about me, but it's just definitely, it's there for the taking, and it can mm -hmm. start from acceptable p premises. It doesn't have to start by breaking the machine before it, before it gets mm -hmm. underway. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Well. I mean, the person who ultimately should raise those questions would be someone like a, a Jack Caputo or somebody like that, someone who's already in the field um, and is already recognized as an authority on the people who are closest to these questions, thinking of uh, Derrida, Derrida and Vatimo and things like that. So that would be the position of greatest authority if that's, if that's what counts. <laughs> right. But... Um, but that's generally, of course, that's exactly right. And, and a lot of this, by the way, depends, depends on um, publishers, just to keep it real here, you know. <laughs> certain publishers in certain parts of the world will result, that, that means the book will not be read. Um, <laughs> Bruce Halsinger uh, wrote a book called The Pre-Modern Condition, mm -hmm. and he analyzes, he looks at Bataille, uh, he looks at um, uh, Derrida and um, Foucault and Lacan, and looks at how they've, 
they all came from specific medieval backgrounds and were their um, their theories were emerging and being and reworking their experience in um, archival work, uh, medieval archival work, and and so what Halsinger is interested in is trying to is seeing this as a revival of medievalism that they play that doesn't get as emphasized as much um, uh, that they didn't um, telegraph necessarily, but that it's something that's it's something that's there, and it seems it seems rather interesting to me that. Um, uh, that that you have a you have a body of theory that derives in large part through um, uh, through a revival of and a fascination with the Middle Ages and he he looks at Augustine he looks at Thomas Aquinas and their and the fascination that those thinkers uh, that the um, uh, that French uh, theory had with those thinkers and where would you go from that critique. How would you develop that into the kind of thing that might, you know, make contact with people who need persuading or? Things? Well, in, on one hand, I think um, you make you make a, a reference in your book that that there has been a there is a certain um, um, theological turn in continental philosophy, and you can look at there are those um, many of those thinkers that have been very um, that have taken. Augustine seriously, um, Leotard writes um, uh, on uh, um, on confessions before he dies, uh, and you have a whole host of, of of philosophers who are very much interested in this kind of philosophical or this um, uh, this religious turn or theological turn, but it hasn't penetrated in the contemporary art world. Art Forum writes as if Derrida has just written of grammatology, and that's it. Uh, that there isn't any. There is. Mm -hmm. well, they, they write as if Spivak just wrote her introduction. They right. The right. No. Exactly. No. Exactly. And so the sense that that uh, contemporary art critical discourse doesn't reflect what's taken place in the last um, in the last 20 years of in in continental philosophy. You have these banners, mm -hmm. these symbolic individuals. So it'd be very interesting to to have a more nuanced Lacan or a more nuanced Foucault or Bataille entering into that mix rather than Krauss. Um, Defining the limits of how Bataille is is um, is put to contemporary artistic practice, for example. But and but here you're addressing something that's very very pragmatic, which is territories, talking about bodies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, who, you know, the academic world is a place where people are very invested in whatever territory they're going to stake out and rep create a reputation on, which is precisely why Boclo would get so upset, right? that he would go and tear down the poster that you were talking about. So I think this idea that we have a free flow of ideas is quite an illusion because people, there's, there's a sense of politics about what kind of things get talked about, what kind of books get made. I mean, even to the point that if you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm working with a press, we're starting a nonprofit press right now dealing with um, art issues, and one of the, the factors in doing this is that you can, if you want to sell the book, if the book's going to be on the shelf, you have to have it in a certain dimension, a certain weight, and certain text. I mean, uh, you know, font size. They, they don't always care what's inside. But, at the same, but within academics, don't, Krauss is going to get pissed, right? In well, the, and so then you have to contend with that. She's been pissed before. I know. But then, but then, <laughs> yeah. And but I, then, I mean, but then I think it's... Right, but, uh, I but think again, the response is we can say, well, you know, she's Rosalind Krauss, and she's at Columbia, and she's... You know, she's this and that, and we cower and we go speak to other people. Or you can go, and, or you can actually get up there and see what you can do and produce yeah. something that's so compelling that it commands interest. And, but, you, and I think, you, though, you do need a community of some sort to back you up to in that. I mean, I think we should always do that. And I know for myself, that's part of the project for me as a, a critic and a you know, theorist is to do that. But you cannot, it's, I don't think you can stand alone. I mean, it's like what we were just saying. You know, if you want to talk about the anxiety of truth within postmodern or post-structuralist ideas, you have to be, you know, damn good at what you're going to be saying in but order I, to stand I worry that. about um, that we ask artists to be out there. We ask artists to do their artistic practice. When we have studio crits with, um, with artists, we're encouraging you guys, or we're, we're encouraging artists to go out there and, there and stake, certain, um, stake certain positions. We're not saying you need to get locked up institutionally, and you can do your own work if you get, if you get a tenure-track job at Claremont, um, but your work is going to be different if, you get, if you're adjuncting at a, at a junior college. 
we're asking artists to push out there, and I think in some ways we should, add, we should be doing the same. I mean, I think that's one of the things that's so interesting to me about, about Jim's work, is that he is, he's risking going out mm -hmm. there and asking or demanding that the inst institution, whatever those institutions are, follow in some way. And well, certain institutions are following um, in a way, but it's not necessarily, de you're not necessarily dependent upon well, then, just to those. say, the way, this seemed, the way this particular project seems from my point of view is that after, after this came out, certain people weren't writing me as much as they were before. It's yeah. not so much a matter of going out and finding people, it's a matter of counting the people you've lost. Um, and then other institutions come in and new opportunities and things like this. I come to places like this and I learn new things, um, but people aren't inviting me to talk in certain places. I was curious about what happened at your home institution, in a Nothing. sense. That's the art world, you know, well, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, I remember a sort of poignant, I guess it was the first student you highlight, the Kim, who was the, uh -huh. sincere, the sincere one. And um, your response, and I know, I've been in those studios, I've been with these students. We have the biggest art school west of the Mississippi. I've been with a lot of students in, this, in their studio space. And you run into this moment, and you have to actually sort of tell a student, uh, don't show that to them. And I, and I, I felt for you <laughs> when I read that. And um, I, I was thinking somehow when this book comes out, and, and your book comes out, it, these, it does make a difference. I mean, you, it, it might be hard for you to see immediate responses, but we're here today. But I, you know, why not show that? Why, why is it your place to edit what she wants to do? Yeah, that's, I mean, that is not a general principle, but in, right. in that particular case, um, that person, she was very insecure about what was really going right, on in right. her work, and she really needed, she really needed theological guidance is what she really wanted. She really wanted to know, I don't remember how much of this I put in the book, but she needed to know, can God be a big hand, right? Can you do that? Is it okay? That kind of thing. But just to, just to widen this out a little bit, this is not uh, a question so much of religious content as it is of art pedagogy, because mm -hmm. yeah. I'm often telling students not to show certain kinds of work. And then a student, just, just recently a student showed me a self-portrait that he had made of himself over a two-year period on a sheet of paper. And the paper had been worn through several times and glued onto a background because he had drawn it so much and it was all these amazing kind of curls and it was just a perfect, it was perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. And I knew that if he showed it to someone, so they might like it because it's obsessive and quirky, sure. Right. But probably they'd say, no, 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 just do a video, you know, relax, you know, <laughs> do something else. So I said, don't show it to anyone. I, I, okay, I, I, and that's why I was thinking, <laughs> did, you, did you did a seminar on this with students at school mm -hmm. and covered yeah. that? So you, so I'm sure your colleagues maybe were wondering what's... No, nobody notices, nobody cares. Nobody knows. <laughs> That's, That's nice. the fun thing about the art world, you know. You could dress up in a clown outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 to jump in here, I think I have a, a I, w I would, I would, I kind of chafe at the idea of disregarding what people are talking about uh, in the wider community doing what I want to do, and then complaining that the institutions don't accept what I want to do. Uh, that there are, there are conversations that are going on that, uh, um, that uh, we have to in, engage in. I, I think that's particularly a response to Christina, but the, the, that, that I, I don't know that we can just pin this on sort of institutions not letting certain ideas in. I think uh, uh, we must produce models that are uh, contributory to a wider community, uh, that are beneficial, that are informed, that are uh, kind of fantastic. What, what, what do you think about that? How, how does a, 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 an artist of faith kind of um, proceed from, from that point of view? Or? within a, a conversation that's already going on without just becoming bitter that no one will listen, right? You know, I taught a seminar last fall on desire. <laughs> desire this fall, hysteria next. <laughs> and we always do um, an exhibit. So I guess I am interested in making sure, rubbing my colleagues' noses in it, uh, in a way. And, and I just have seen pedagogically 
it's not that I'm trying to really train them for curatorial, although a lot of them are going on to museum studies and doing that from the experience, but there's just something about watching students at a state school who don't always have a really privileged background in theory, watching them grasp theory when we actually have to put it into practice and live it, you know, through, through making a show. And uh, we did Desire, and it, it, it went in some very interesting directions. I think we had the there's a sign you have to put outside your show if, there's, if you want to caution people about work. We, had a, we were ordered to have two big signs. So, <laughs> but there was a student, a student in the class, and I, had, I didn't really know. To, at the end, they were all supposed to channel this in their own research projects. And she started telling me that she was from a very religious family and that her sibling was going to a religious school and that all of this was so new. So, I mean, she was reading Deleuze and, and Lacan and, and so new to her and she um, really wanted to work on that for her last project. And I, I just, you have to work on it. When she told me this, I felt like you have to do it. And it was, she wasn't the best theory student, but she went and interviewed a lot of people and, and started talking about issues that this had opened up for her. And, and her, when it was come time to do the presentation, she didn't have a lot of it resolved that it was the best work she did for me all semester. So I was, and I'm thinking that this, I might do a, you know, what, what do I do after hysteria? I think I might do something on the subject from this. So I do think these things, branch out. I mean, I think that's what discourse is. It's running language and you... Mm -hmm. it, it, I was very, very happy that student felt she could go public, so to speak, in my seminar. My seminar's got a real hip value, you know, cool factor. And I was... <laughs> which you can see how much I buy into it. But she, she... She... What I liked about it so much, she felt she wanted to do it, she threw herself into it, and the other students were a fantastic audience. And this, I, I was a little nervous for her, and I knew right away I didn't have to be. We couldn't even finish our talks that day because so many students wanted to, it, it just got discussion going in an incredible way. So I think sometimes our, our maybe some of our fears about institutional phobias Maybe they don't, you know, what is an institution anyway, but the people who are there, mm -hmm. so. I, I'm sorry, I'm such a chatter, but <laughs> I'm like talking all the time. But um, I, you know, that chapter really bothered me specifically. One is because I felt like you, I don't know about you, but when I go into a studio, especially a grad student, and you know, people go into the MFA program to make work that is terrible before they come out. And so you go in there, it's a bit of a privileged space, and then you go in and publish that encounter with this woman who obviously had you come oh. in. Oh yeah, but that's completely disguised. All those identities are totally disguised. But was she so, would not see herself when she read that chapter? But she saw the stuff. She was, she was fine with my with description. With the book. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. No, I was careful about that, and some of the genders are changed too. So <laughs> well, that's you know, great. They're, they're pretty Talking about disguised. bodies? Yeah. But, um, <laughs> The other thing, too, was Now we that, want to know the true story. <laughs> yeah. and the other thing, too, is that, um, talking about pedagogy, you know, you, you say to her, don't show it. And I, I feel, I, I've run into this, too, specifically at this school, when I would do studio visits with the seniors for their show in the undergraduate, you know, program that we have. Rather than saying, don't show it, I, I prefer to say, okay, here's where this will lead you. And here is where this image, this sign is embedded in, with the tradition that is encompassed within that sign. You must choose what you want to do with it. I don't think it's my position to say do not show or show. It's their choice. They want to put it out there. They have to face the heat of it. But all I can do is to just tell them and lay out the groundwork. Isn't that really what we should be doing as instructors? Yeah, I'm sorry if it came off too dogmatic. I, I don't think I was too dogmatic uh, with it. But, well, if I remember that... You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah in that specific question. sense, it sounded like the student really did have... She wasn't even asking you to show it, right? I mean, she said, here's my, here's my real work. Here's the work I do for school. She already 
in some sense, you said she, her English wasn't that good for yeah, theory, but it sounded like she was savvy enough to figure out that if I'm going to work on this, it's, it's not, she had already figured yeah, out. Yeah, I had that research. such a hard time mm -hmm. with that. Like, if she's not savvy, what is she doing in the program? These are very, mm -hmm. these are really interesting, really, to me, really interesting issues. I don't want to take up really any more time, time on them, but to say very quickly that um, Korean Americans, Koreans are our biggest minority for some reason of historical happenstance. It's our biggest minority. There's a Korean Students Association. There have been some really interesting, um, very strong disagreements between the Korean Americans and the Korean students, and there's, there are all kinds of cultural things you know all about this. So I've been doing, I've been dealing with this for years. And I asked at one point to the president, the then president of the Korean Students Association, could I sit in and hear, you know, at least some of these things. The answer was, it wouldn't be worth your time because we spend most of our time arguing about whether we should have it in Korean or English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh, really? sometimes the arguments are kind of perpetual yeah. and you know hard to get into the, hard to get into the. Yeah, you haven't even gone to Korean American churches though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and what was what was that other word that came up at lunch? Responsibility or dependability or reliability, something like that. Yeah, and I think this is a really, really interesting, really central thing, which I would love to spend maybe the rest of the time talking about. I don't have a ready answer for that, except that what I meant by authenticity there was that um, it's, it can seem that if the faith is not yours, but you know that it's something that you could look up on Wikipedia, and it's real, um, it can seem to somehow, therefore, automatically be reliable, to use a different word than authentic. So then, you could then infer, the inference would be the artist was sincere. But I think this is a really interesting topic for all of us, because looking, especially, especially from the position of, of artists of faith, looking, looking toward people who are practices that aren't necessarily, then the question becomes, it's very different. It looks different from this side. Um, and it bears a different kind of a weight. And that's why I was trying to, starting to say sort of at lunch that maybe that this word, sincerity, n n might be treacherous. It, because it, seem, it can seem maybe tainted a little bit by, um, what, by layers of postmodern irony that have been slapped all over it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all I meant by authenticity there was a, a, a property of truth from which you would then infer the artist was sincere. I think that would be reasonable. I found it interesting you just brought up the word irony because I kept thinking during the conversation earlier that when it gets hard to define what the term is, it gets a little easier to say what it is not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it does seem to me that it, sort of def it exists in a kind of foil relationship with irony in some sense, maybe Definitely. sincerity. I think mm -hmm. the fear of a word like that is it might smack, I'd like to be so sincere about it, but it might smack a little bit of patronizing sense that, well, they're sincere, but they just don't know better. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I always worry with all of, all of this. Irony. I mean, uh, you know, some of the art that we laugh at with, with this, I, even with Thomas Kincaid, I felt, you know, I, I don't just want to use it I, I want to take time to look at it, but of course, the more time I took to look at it, the more mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't the more seem can... sincere. Let's no, put no, it that no, way. No, it could more and more sincere. <laughs> yeah. But the, in terms of irony, that's um, irony in literary criticism is 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 often called let's the master trope of modernism. Mm -hmm. And but what right. it's meant, what what's meant by it in those contexts is not irony as you learn in English class as a species of wit or sarcasm or something. What's meant by that is self awareness. And then that's mm -hmm. why this is such a difficult subject, because mm -hmm. then in that case, sincerity, if that's the converse of it, if that's the opposite, mm -hmm. then sincerity would be some state of immersive obliviousness. Not just trust in a Christian sense, but yeah, but really unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you definitely don't want to go down that road. So, I'd like to introduce a question that actually came up um, at lunch that's related to this, um, that I think is important to at least um, address. Why is it that sincerity, for want of a better term, when it's from other perspectives, say a, a strong political conviction that someone's operating from, you know, a, another <laughs> worldview system, um, is somehow accept acceptable? And as we were discussing at lunch, or raised the question at, at lunch, from the perspective of scholars or critics who are operating from very strong con convictions and affiliations, um, their work is not necessarily considered suspect 
if it's learned that they may, for example, um, be operating from a Marxist you know, standpoint and have very, very strong commitments, personal commitments, or to use another, a very, very strong feminist commitments. Um, why is it that the sincerity or the, the personal investment from those worldview um, commitments are, are not suspect or do not make their work suspect, but a religious or, you know, I'm very hesitant about, I mean, religion is so weighted, um, but other worldview commitments then are. Um, <coughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, no, that's very true. Well, I mean, one of the things that's in the background of all of this, though, is that talk about sincerity is also talk about intentions. Back to this question of intention and anti-intentionalist criticism. So one of the points of suspicion about sincerity from the academic establishment would be that it's a discourse that, that is interested in figuring out the location of, of the artist's intention. And that itself is already a problem for any number of critics. So, and, and this is not not to answer your mm -hmm. question, but just to make it make it more mm -hmm. more complex. And so, maybe to find substitutes for sincerity might be a really good way to to start. And maybe the most neutral one would just be truth, the way philosophers mm -hmm. talk about truth. Mm -hmm. And I would actually would have loved it if your paintings that we were looking at could could put been in here. John mm -hmm. has a couple of a pair. Well, it's one piece, but it's a pair of paintings in the gallery which are really wonderful, I think, and they show, a, um, they show, well, you should describe them, but they show, it's a view into a chapel or an alcove, but you can't see it because past the grating there's a cloth and down, and you have two of them side by side there. So you could say about that that there's a, there's a whole discourse of truth in those. What can be accessible, what's behind it, obviously. What's accessible to us to know, right? And it, what is back there. All of that you can talk about in terms of truth without bringing in questions of sincerity. Um, that you could just bracket that out and you could get most of the work done that you would want to do about the meaning of the piece. Isn't it too, sincerity is a very problematic word because it's always tied to sentimentality? I mean, I don't know if you noticed that, but I always thought and it, mm -hmm. well, well, I wonder if the issue is not so much the sincerity on the part of the artist, but the complexity of how the meaning is held in the, in the work how the meaning kind of congregates around the work. But the problem with Kincaid is that you investigate it uh, and you kind of, it sort of uh, collapses into one liner, mm -hmm. whereas an equally uh, sincere artist like Anselm Kiefer has such sort of complexity in the way that the thing holds meaning that uh, uh, the sincerity is not the issue as much as the, the kind of visual language used mm -hmm. to engage it. You know? Visual language is another, let's not yeah. talk about that, but the, the way the meaning is uh, held and kind of collected. Another thing, I mean, all we're doing here is, I think, making a list of all the reasons why this is so problematic a thing. So just to mm -hmm. add another one to that, yeah. you can have, uh, sincerity can be an aesthetic virtue. For example, Jeff Koons, his insincerity is an aesthetic virtue. People are fascinated by it. How mm -hmm. can anyone be that consistently insincere for years and years, right? That, that's be interesting. To, yeah. to, to but the converse is not true. You don't ask yourself, how could Thomas Kincaid be so sincere? But it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a value. Mm -hmm. You know, if he was really sincere, he'd be giving it away. Right? Mm -hmm. I'll start. <laughs> um, in, in a sense, that's, that's something or the point that I was trying to bring up um, in, in my remarks was that, um, and, and I think actually Dr. Alkin's book um, supports this idea that there are many different forms and arenas of art and, and in a sense these different scopes that they that they operate in and, and I've actually had a couple of conversations today with people before um, I made my remarks on that very issue that the contemporary um, art world is is dealing in one arena and attempting to find um, to borrow from uh, James Romaine's remarks to me, who's back in the audience here, some of you know him and his work, um, that the contemporary art world is trying to find a discourse to deal with some of the most pressing issues that, in a sense, historically, um, we are having to grapple with in our own moment. Some um, artists of faith 
will feel very called to engage in that specific conversation and to will necessarily need to in, engage in the language, visual or otherwise, um, uh, to, to do that effectively. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other things for art and artists to do that aren't legitimate. And I think um, I, if I'm hearing um, Dr. Elkins correctly, that's the way he would understand it as well. Um, that we have to understand the particular program and project in a, in a sense of this specific arena that he's talking about. And that individual artists have to seek and find their particular vocation. You know, what are you called to do? Well, I, in answer to his question first, I, because I am a, one of the religious people here, right? Because <laughs> you said to the religious people. Um, I, I think it's funny, you know, we start with this idea of the body, and, you know, this, this word contemporary art, you, people create a body for it when there really isn't a body for it. I, don't you think it's ironic that we're here today when the new museum in New York has opened its, you know, it is now institutional building when it first started, you know, what happened? Marsha Tucker leaves, and she's pissed because the work she wants to show, they don't want to show it, and so she goes and creates her own museum, and then all these people that she wants to show who didn't have a place for their work ends up getting shown. Now it's history. Now they got an institution. That is contemporary art. That is the contemporary art space. And this idea that it is a monolith, and that it is some sort of a you know, place with fences that you can't get into is an illusion that you, you know, put chains around yourself with. And I, I, don't, I have to say this again and again, especially at the school, and I'm not quite sure why. Maybe it's because we're so obsessed with rules. But, um, <laughs> you know, if you don't have a place to show your stuff, if you have no grounds for discourse, create your own journal. Spread it around. Get your show. Always have some kind of a writer mixed in with that, and you're sure to be historicized and document everything. You know, that's the only thing, and then you stand the test of time, then you're a success. But you, you know, this, it's a kind of a, a red herring to constantly be like, how do I get in there? Do I belong in there? Do I not? You're already there. But you, nobody's recognized you, so you feel like you don't belong. You, you have to get past it. Uh, I don't know about the Titanic metaphor per se, but the idea of the, of the contemporary art world being somehow ultimately irrelevant or even maybe immediately irrelevant um, would have to do with what you think the, that contemporary art in some version of it is expressing. You would have two, to put it in completely schematic terms, you have two choices. One is the art world, for however you want to define it at any given moment, is expressing things that are um, of interest to the people who are consuming that art, including the people who are writing, making a living off it, and all the rest of that. And then those people, whoever they may be at that moment, no matter how um, variable that boundary is, are somehow over there, and other people, maybe most of the world, is over here. That's one way. But the other choice, just to put it in really stark terms, is that it's often been the case, uh, uh, and since modernism and the broad sweep of things, that people have thought that at the time that what was contemporary art wasn't expressing their world, and then it turned out later that it was. So you have, that's in really black and white terms, obviously, but there's a big issue there about deciding whether or not it's the Titanic, and if you want to jump ship, where mm -hmm. are you? I think I went into art to avoid science and math, it, originally, <laughs> originally. And you can see from my talk that I've grown more and more fascinated by it. And I've watched my students um, starting to, trying to understand, you know, reading Green about the elegant universe and trying to understand superstring theory. And um, there's a poetics there that comes in some sense close to what I used to see in, in certain romantic sensibilities about transcendence or the sublime, and that has this edge of something that's scientific that um, makes it seem more vital and more important now than some of the, it's, it's like a, a, I'm trying, what I'm trying to get at is it's in some ways it's a way to keep some of those ideas and those yearnings alive it doesn't feel like a false consciousness because there really is so much happening. The genome code. Is there anything more 
amazing in a way than, than what they're learning about this and where that's going to take us. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I actually think the issue of science really figures in closely to any talk about art and religion right now. And the, these are all different interwoven stories and academia does have a problem when it starts setting them into separate disciplines. So the more we can learn to be trans and go across and, and read each other's complexity, I think that's good for our survival. And, and it seems that the, the reason for that is that uh, culture is always uh, undergoing the work of picturing the cosmos, picturing uh, uh, the meaning of existence. Uh, and we do that through the sciences, we do that through the arts, we do that uh, in all of our ways, uh, trying to clearly articulate our, our picture of, of existence. And that will always be essentially a faith-based endeavor, and it can, it can only be that. If we think in terms of pictures and activities, uh, this, uh, the, the strange place of religion in contemporary art can't. It will continue to be strange, but it can't ever exclude itself because it's always a um, picture. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to end there.